few moments in history inspire the grandeur, glory, and passion of the American Revolution, and fewer still have been so thoroughly documented. But there is more to this epic event than most history books tell. Much, much more. During wartime, morals often become looser, and people will do things they'd never even think of doing during peacetime. It was a time when patriotic fervor took on new meaning. He's sleeping in late, he's staying up late and partying all the time, he's got women sitting in his lap. A time when every alliance was thoroughly scrutinized. I think if you're 19 and an army comes to town with handsome men in uniform, you're gonna be swept away. Sex in the American Revolution, next. America's war for independence from Britain is one of the great turning points in world history. During the bloody eight-year conflict from 1775 through 1783, 13 colonies broke free from a powerful mother country and lit the fire of freedom. More than 225 years later, the war's legacy reverberates with battles remembered and heroes revered. But while the military and political exploits have been endlessly recounted, another more human side to the war has frequently escaped attention. Given the coyness of the era, today's historians must read between the lines to find out what actually happened between the sheets. There's a certain understanding among the gentlemen that gentlemen do things when they are far away from home and far away from their wives and sweethearts to take care of whatever their needs are, but they don't talk about it or they don't write about it. It's done with a nod and a wink. When a great deal of men and a great deal of women uh, got together, as they did in the Continental and British armies, sex happens. On the eve of the American Revolution, colonial sexual attitudes and practices were as varied as the colonies themselves. In the New England area, there was obviously the stereotypical puritanical attitude about sex, which was forbidden outside of marriage, and it wasn't for fun. As you move down the coast to New York, you find a much more open attitude because it's a commercial center. In fact, it was more open in every aspect of all the vices of society, gambling, drinking, and prostitution. When you get down to the southernmost colonies, you've got rich plantation owners who certainly took mistresses and had affairs, but this was something that was not put forth in public, it certainly wasn't flaunted, and it was kept strictly as a private thing. Marriage, especially for the middle and upper classes, was often more of a business relationship, a union intended to further one's social or monetary interests. It was not a marriage of love. It was a marriage of convenience. And because of that, it was not unusual for men later to take mistresses or to have affairs outside of the marriage. But a lot of the wives turned a blind eye to this because as long as their position wasn't threatened, they allowed their husbands to have these dalliances. Women did not have equal rights in those days. They certainly didn't have equal sexual rights. Um, people took the same kind of marriage oaths as they do today, but we do know that men strayed fairly frequently. I'm not saying women didn't, but it seems to be a, a sort of a more accepted thing. One of the colonial era's more intriguing innuendos was a European custom found in the ballrooms and salons of the wealthy. Here, flirting had been raised to a fine art using only a skillfully handled fan. A slight touch to the cheek or a swift flutter was often a prelude to sex, a secret communication from a lady to a potential lover. 
One young beauty no doubt adept at this fandango was 18-year-old Peggy Shippen, the youngest daughter of Edward Shippen, a well-known Philadelphia physician. There was a social order for the women as well as the men in upper-class society in Philadelphia, and Peggy Shippen was Philadelphia's top debutante, the most beautiful woman in Philadelphia. Peggy was very beautiful, evidently rather blonde and ethereal. She very much liked to wear the best cloth, the best jewels, the best of everything. She was on Imelda Marcos when it came to clothing. No, she never had enough. For Peggy, the approach of war seemed at best an opportunity, and at worst, an inconvenience. Her father had adopted a neutral political stance that resulted in a severe loss of income from his loyalist clientele. Despite this, Peggy continued to put a strain on the family budget with her extravagant spending. Peggy's allegiance was yet to be determined. And as the war progressed, Peggy would rely upon her sexual wiles to get what she wanted. April 19th, 1775. 700 British troops had orders to seize a suspected warehouse of rebel weapons located in Concord, Massachusetts. Standing in their way, in nearby Lexington were 70 scared but determined local militiamen. The fighting lasted only a few minutes. When it was over, eight Americans and one British soldier lay dead. The Revolutionary War was underway. Suddenly, tens of thousands of young, mostly unmarried men left home and moved into army encampments. For soldiers on both sides, war meant hardship and deprivation, but not complete deprivation. It was an era when a soldier in the field was often accompanied by his wife, mother, or sister. These camp followers were part of an unofficial military tradition that dated back to ancient Greek and Roman times. Revolutionary War records indicate as many as 20,000 women traveled with the opposing armies. The British military brought along roughly one woman for every eight soldiers. In those days, you had basically three kinds of soldiers, officers, men in the ranks, and boys who were too young to serve as soldiers and who were musicians. There were no logistical support troops the way our army has today. So in return for rations from the army, the women came along, and the women and children did many of the support activities, things like cooking, uh, doing the laundry, sometimes doing some of the nursing, making the uniforms. Washington didn't like it, but it did keep his troop numbers up, so he went along with it. Most camp followers had legitimate reasons to be with the soldiers, but inevitably a few were drawn by the wages of sin. This was especially true in the British camps, where the Redcoats were relatively well paid and a long way from home. British camps were much more wild in the way that they were open about prostitution, drinking, and the image of a British soldier who was consorting with women and having fun, basically, because he had time for it. He had the money for it, un unlike his American counterpart. Privacy, or the lack thereof, never seemed to be a major concern for any of these soldiers, British or American. There were, of course, soldiers' private tents. Um, they weren't so private, but at least you had a layer of canvas between you and the world. Um, there are always bushes. There was always behind the stone fence. Um, it was an age where privacy was not as common as the kind of privacy that we're used to today. And if you lived with the Army, you were used to doing all of your bodily functions in full view of a number of people, so this one didn't bother you either. While vices of various kinds entertained the troops on both sides, American military officials did seek to establish a high moral tone. 
After being named Commander-in-Chief in June of 1776, General George Washington showed everyone what it meant to be an officer and a gentleman. George Washington was probably one of the first matinee idols of this country. He was tall and quite handsome. He was very charming and graceful. He loved to dance. He loved to flirt. Uh, wherever he went, he was besieged by people offering him flowers and food and ribbons and probably other kinds of offers if he'd wanted to take them up on it. But Washington was well aware of the pitfalls of power. Wartime diaries and records reveal the general to be a man who scrupulously avoided even a hint of scandal. Washington is not the plaster saint that he became shortly after his death. Certainly he had vices, but he was very conscious of his, uh, of his station and what his persona meant to the army and to the whole revolution. Though he himself may have been beyond reproach, Washington knew there was a time and a place for everything. And he was not above using sex as a weapon against the enemy. In December of 1776, the American Army's second highest ranking officer, General Charles Lee, inexplicably traveled in between the American and British lines to spend the night in a New Jersey tavern with a woman of questionable morals. The next morning, as General Lee prepared to depart, an advanced troop of 50 British soldiers surrounded the tavern and captured him. Lee's ill-advised sexual dalliance was a terrible blow to Washington. The general now faced two problems. First, he needed to capture a British general in order to conduct a prisoner exchange. And second, the circumstances surrounding Lee's capture presented a public relations nightmare. Washington set in motion a sting operation. He engaged a patriotic prostitute from Rhode Island to lure British Major General Richard Prescott into a most compromising position. Once compromised, Prescott was summarily captured and Washington had his important prisoner. Soon after, Prescott was exchanged for Lee. The whole affair inspired a humorous ditty of the day. What various lures there are to ruin man? Woman, the first and foremost, all bewitches. A nymph thus spoiled a general's mighty plan and gave him to the foe without his breeches. The art and literature of the late 18th century reveal a dark underbelly to everyday life in the cities of England and the colonies. Artists such as Thomas Rowlandson and William Hogarth depicted the sexual proclivities of both the upper and lower classes in graphic detail. One of the period's most explicit and hence popular novels was Fanny Hill, Memoir of a Woman of Pleasure. The salacious story, along with a scandalous collection of pornographic drawings, recounted the tale of an innocent country girl who ends up becoming a high-class prostitute in London. During the war, the book could be found tucked into the personal effects of soldiers on both sides. Fanny's adventures crossed political lines. He advanced then to my bedside and whilst he faltered out his message, I could observe his color rise and his eyes lighten with joy in seeing me in a situation as favorable to his loosest wishes as if he had bespoke the play. Fanny Hill presented a romanticized image of the prostitute, but the reality in the colonies once the war started was much different. In the 18th century, prostitution wasn't just a choice of a lifestyle. It was, for many women, the only ways that you could survive. There was no social security in those days. Many women were left 
uh, homeless. Many women were left widowed who had no other way of supporting families. So when you think about prostitution, you have to think of it as the 18th century's only safety net for women. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle, Daddy. Mind the music and the step and with the girls be handy. Throughout the war, large concentrations of troops on both sides occupied the major American port cities such as Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Along their waterfronts, an odd collection of taverns served as fronts for gambling, drinking, and whoring. A lot of these urban areas were seen as bad influences on the soldiers. In fact, when Washington's army occupied New York, he tried to regulate how many men could go into town because they would be abused, taken advantage of, in some cases not just robbed, but even murdered. Despite all of these efforts, he just could not prevent the men from going into the big city and seeing what it was like. We are in Elfrist's Alley, the oldest residential street in colonial America. It's right around the corner from the toughest neighborhood in Philadelphia, an area that they called Helltown which had so many notorious taverns, and uh, they were rough, they were noisy, they were dirty, full of smoke. It was not a very pleasant atmosphere. It was mainly for the guys, naturally. The women who frequented them were there for basically one purpose, to sell yourself. By far the wildest city during the war was New York. When the British troops occupied the city from 1776 through 1778, prostitutes from around the colonies flocked here to ply their lucrative trade. These women of pleasure came to be known by a variety of colorful names. There's a dictionary that was written in 1790s. It was called the Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. It was written by Captain Gross and Hellfire Dick. There were several uh, words to describe prostitutes. Trollop, bawd, doxy uh, were all in there because a British soldier had a red coat. A woman said to have slept with a British soldier uh, was said to have made a lobster kettle out of herself. New York City's flesh trade was concentrated in an area several blocks wide, located behind St. Paul's Church. Today, little evidence remains of this infamous shantytown known as the Holy Ground. But over 200 years ago, this area was filled with the worst elements of society. Vagrants, prostitutes, criminals. It was certainly not a place for any respectable person, as one witness vividly remembered. The whores continue their employ. Their unparalleled conduct is sufficient antidote against any desires that a person can have that has one spark of modesty or virtue left in him. General Howe thought that if he took over the rebel capital, he would end the war earlier. Just the opposite happened. In the fall of 1777, British commander William Howe and his 13,000-man army moved south from New York and captured Philadelphia, the largest and richest city in the colonies. In the city of brotherly love, Howe and his British troops found a loyalist female population awaiting them with open arms. You're in Society Hill in colonial Philadelphia, and a lot of the wealthiest people lived right around here. In a way, this was millionaire's row in the colonial period. When Howe and his troops marched in, they became embedded in Philadelphia, literally embedded in Philadelphia. During their eight-month occupation, the men in red used their charms and a little military intelligence to seduce the local ladies. A secret code word, payaqua, was whispered to a young lady. If she responded in kind, plans were arranged for a steamy midnight rendezvous in her bedchamber. 
I think if you're 19 and an army comes to town with handsome men in uniform, you're going to be swept away. One of these young debutantes was Rebecca Franks, whose father, by the way, had brought the Liberty Bell to Philadelphia. Uh, she writes to a friend outside of Philadelphia, you've got to come in and join the social scene. My social calendar is busy all the time. My dancing card is busy. There are dozens of officers that uh, want to dance with me. I never have a dull moment. There are plays, there's theater, uh, there are balls. They're just having one good time in Philadelphia. As the British troops settled into their comfortable surroundings, it was inevitable they would run into the most desirable debutante in Philadelphia, the city's belle of the ball, the one and only Peggy Shippen. She was beautiful, she was single, and she was on the prowl. When the British soldiers took over Philadelphia, she was right there dancing with them all evening at the balls and the fancy dances in Philadelphia. Uh, she was part of that social swirl. Peggy Shippen was indeed in her element, but her fairy tale was about to strike midnight. Her desire for the good life and a good time would soon lead her into the arms of the revolution's most notorious turncoat. As the end of 1777 approached, the war had bogged down into a stalemate. British forces continued to maintain control in and around Philadelphia, but General William Howe refused to extend his army's supply lines in order to attack the American forces based in Valley Forge, just 40 miles west. This resulted in long stretches of military inactivity especially during the winter months. The perception soon arose that the British officers were more concerned about their maneuvers in the bedroom than on the battlefield. No one exemplified the philandering British officer more than General William Howe himself. His subordinates often complained that Sir Billy continually let the American army slip away while he idled about, sometimes with the wives of wealthy loyalists or underlings. General Howe's most infamous dalliance was with Mrs. Elizabeth Loring, the wife of a mid-level British officer. The voluptuous Elizabeth apparently shared Howe's tastes for drinking, gambling, and sex. Several rousing British ballads memorialize their well-known romantic fling. Awake, arise, Sir Billy. There's forage on the plain. Ah, leave your little filly and join in the campaign. But the American troops came up with a better song, thanks to Francis Hopkinson, America's first composer. He did something like this. Sir William, he as snug as a flea, lay all this time a-snoring. No fear of harm as he lays warm in bed with Mrs. Loring, in bed with Mrs. Loring. Britain's most flamboyant officer was Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. He commanded the British force in Canada, which included German-speaking mercenaries, the Hessians. Burgoyne was a high liver. He was somebody who was well thought of by the soldiers. He cared about his men. But those who socialize with him and so on notice all the wines he's bringing along when the army is moving in a very Spartan fashion. And they notice that, you know, he needs to have a good dinner and have a good carousing afterward in the evening. You know, it's one way to, you know, get over a hard battle during the day or a hard day's march. And uh, this starts to add up. One woman adding it up was the wife of a Hessian commander fighting alongside Burgoyne, the Baroness Frederica von Riedesel. She kept a diary during her travels with the army in which she chronicled Burgoyne's personal indiscretions. She was sensing that as this campaign was starting to go sour, 
that the blame might fall on the Germans, not on the British regulars, and started to watch as Burgoyne carried on a dalliance with the wife of his commissary. Burgoyne liked having a jolly time and spending half the night singing and drinking and amusing himself in the company of the wife of a commissary who was his mistress, and like him, loved champagne. Shortly after the Baroness made that diary entry, Burgoyne and the Hessians were defeated at the epic Battle of Saratoga in October of 1777. Was Gentleman Johnny's womanizing a factor? We may never know, but Saratoga was a turning point, the first major American victory of the war. In the spring of 1778, in the wake of Burgoyne's disastrous defeat, General William Howe resigned his commission and was replaced by Sir Henry Clinton. Under orders from London, Clinton organized an immediate withdrawal from Philadelphia back to New York. However, before departing Philadelphia, the British officer corps sent out invitations to their loyalist friends for one last wild costume party. It was called the Mischianza, an Italian word meaning melody. This decadent celebration featured massive feasts, spectacular fireworks, and almost certainly a few lustful encounters. They uh, scheduled it like a medieval tournament. The British officers wore the garb of uh, medieval knights and they had fake jousting. They uh, had a number of Philadelphia's high society women dress up like uh, a Turkish harem, uh, wearing very gauzy uh, see-through clothes. The party went on all night until four in the morning. When the American army reoccupied Philadelphia in mid-1778, the proof of the local ladies' fraternization with the enemy was evident in a new unusual fashion. Bustles, or rumps made of cork, had been added to the backside of a dress to help hide a pregnant belly. One returning American soldier shared the feelings held by many. Many people do not hesitate in supposing that most of the young ladies have purchased them at the expense of their virtue. It is agreed on all hands that the British officers played the devil with the girls. There was one girl, however, who played devil with the boys, and that was Peggy Shippen. With her British suitors now gone, Peggy Shippen's extravagant lifestyle was in serious jeopardy. But the resourceful young temptress with loyalist leanings quickly latched on to a new lover to keep her in the money, a man who would do anything to make her happy, the recently arrived American commander of the army in Philadelphia, General Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold when he got to Philadelphia, just loved this high-class lifestyle. After all, he'd been uh, on the road as a military man for the last several years, and he fell in love with high society here, uh, and certainly in love with Peggy Shippen. First of all, he was a much older man, and if she hadn't been so actively interested in the British, she might not have been so thoroughly shunned by many of the city's people when they returned after the British had left. Did you know that Benedict Arnold actually recycled his love letters? He took love letters he'd used for a failed romance in Boston, and he rewrote them with a couple of slight changes, obviously the name, and that's how he won Peggy Shippen's heart. After a brief but intense courtship, the two were married. Arnold was now supporting a sister, three children from a previous marriage, and a new expensive wife. Over the course of the next two years, Benedict Arnold's military career stalled. 
Without an increase in pay and no let up in his wife's lavish lifestyle, Arnold grew increasingly frustrated. Benedict Arnold was so dissatisfied with not receiving the promotions he expected, and in fact, George Washington was livid over it as well, uh, wrote an angry letter to the Continental Congress about it. Finally, Benedict Arnold slipped and turned over to the British side. How much influence the Tories supporting Peggy had is not known, but it was clear that the British had the money to win Arnold's loyalty. Unfortunately for Arnold, his desperate plot to surrender West Point to the British for 20,000 pounds sterling was discovered. Today, Benedict Arnold's name is synonymous with the word traitor, but his true legacy goes beyond the obvious. His is the timeless tale of a morally corrupt man caught in the seductive web of a beautiful woman. Their names are legendary. Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, Franklin. They are heroic, almost mythic figures, revered for their tireless work in creating a new and better nation. But it's easy to forget these men had personal lives that were turned upside down by the war. Before the revolt broke out, Englishman Thomas Paine, famed author of Common Sense, abandoned his wife and family and moved to America in support of the rebel cause. In Boston, John Hancock, the first signer of the Declaration of Independence, broke off a long-running affair with his Tory girlfriend, a well-known Massachusetts madam. And Alexander Hamilton spent almost the entire war in a pursuit to meet and marry a rich woman. The wonderful expression, Washington slept here. Unfortunately, it has very mundane explanation. Throughout the revolution, Washington never strayed from his army, literally only visiting Mount Vernon twice in the eight years of the war. So wherever the army is, Washington would occupy a portion or all of some house. So when you come here, especially here in New Jersey, you sometimes think that you're tripping over places where Washington slept. But really, that's about all that can be inferred from it. One place where General George Washington slept was in his headquarters at Valley Forge. Here, as at most winter encampments, Washington was joined by his wife, Martha. The same privilege was extended to all married officers. It had a, a, an efficacious effect on the morale of the whole army. The officers would be in a better mood. They would be much more patient with the men. Uh, and a number of the private soldiers in their journals would remark about that. Washington tried to set an example for his army, and most married American officers did their best to remain faithful to their wives. One who did not was General Anthony Wayne, Mad Anthony Wayne. Anthony Wayne thought that he was irresistible to ladies. He was a very uh, outgoing man. There are certainly many, many rumors about his behavior and, and at least one instance when it can fairly well be proved that he took up with a lady half his age. She's usually referred to, since they didn't like to use ladies' names in those conjunctions, as the Belle of the Delaware. C'était le premier grand homme de la Renaissance de l'Amérique, le premier Don Juan. Benjamin Franklin was one of the titans of the American Revolution. He was also perhaps the country's first Don Juan. He not only had a lifelong yearning for the opposite sex, he also openly boasted of his prowess in the bedroom. Ben was the most famous man who ever lived in the 18th century and very popular. And since he was so charming, the ladies just fell for him. And Franklin so loved the ladies that he applied his well-known inventive mind to creating a device for seduction. Ben had a stool put together called Dr. Franklin's kissing machine. He discovered if you rub your feet on a wire mesh, you give yourself an electrical charge. And when you kiss somebody, you give them a shock.
During the revolutionary period, Franklin served as America's ambassador to France. Here, the unassuming Franklin lived le bon vie, the good life, while fighting the war at Parisian dinner parties. Franklin in Paris becomes this wonderful image of the American to all these people around the French court. He doesn't dress fancy. He's wearing rather humble shopkeepers' outfits and also feeds their image that these Americans, uh, however rustic, have some kind of uh, genius um, uh, amongst them, uh, being so creative. And Franklin seems to take good advantage of this, that all these women around the French court who are fawning over him as mon cher papa. John Adams, when he comes over, complains that he can hardly ever get to meet Ben because he's sleeping in late, he's staying up late and partying all the time, he's got women sitting in his lap. Uh, Adams thinks this is a scandal. Why aren't you here convincing the crown to come to our aid? But you see, Ben won all those royalty over, and they leaned on that young king. And that's what got us the loans we needed and the ammunition and the cannonade and finally 6,000 French troops. However Franklin convinced the French to align with the Americans, it was not solely based on his charms. He had help from others, including a foul-mouthed American expatriate in London who would earn a wild reputation. In America's long struggle for independence, Women used their charms and wiles in a series of undercover espionage activities that provided crucial intelligence for both sides. In military encampments especially, the many women roaming about presented plenty of cause for worry. Washington uh, was very uh, concerned about women coming into his camps uh, to visit soldiers. Uh, he was afraid that they would be there gathering information or trying to get the men to desert. One woman no one suspected was a London-based, American-born artist who was very popular with the upper class. Her name was Patience Wright. Flamboyant and irreverent, Wright was infamous for her use of swear words. Still, she was a favorite of the king and queen, going so far as to address them by their first names. Her shocking behavior endeared her to the royals and proved to be the perfect cover. There's the possibility that she was actually forwarding information that would be useful to the American colonists in their war of independence, and she was forwarding that to Ben Franklin. For her duty, which may have involved the bedding of numerous high British officials, Patience Wright was famously denounced in London as the Queen of Sluts. In October of 1781, a decisive victory by the American and French forces at the Battle of Yorktown ended the fighting. During the course of the war, the total number of battle casualties exceeded 20,000 killed or wounded. Thousands more became sick or seriously ill when they contracted any number of diseases, including the social ones. Throughout the war, the high level of sexual activity led to a dramatic spread in venereal diseases, even though there was protection available. This is a replica of a period condom. It is made of lamb's gut. The ribbon was used to secure it in place. The condoms of the era were handmade, and their effectiveness was dubious. We're not sure statistically how many cases of Trans sexually transmitted diseases there were during the American Revolution. But we know that it was common in both civilian and army life. 
We know that both armies, when they stocked their medical chests, whether it was for encampment or when they were on campaign in the field, they had the wherewithal to cure various venereal diseases. Once a soldier was infected, a series of painful medical procedures was the only cure. The first step was a six to eight week course of mercury-laced brandy used to purge the body of any impurities. This made one's hair and teeth fall out. And that was the easy part. One of the first steps that would be done once you were ill was to try to purge your blood so that you would make new blood that was not tainted. And so um, you would use a bleeding knife or a lancet. Um, which would open a vein in an appropriate place near the surface, and the doctor would prescribe how much to take. Um, this is a bleeding bowl of the time, and if you filled it, it would hold six ounces. They would give you regular enemas with what's called a clister. You filled this up with something that would encourage the bowels to release um, their material, and you would frequently flood people four to six times a day for perhaps several weeks to help clean them out. Um, since this causes pain and swelling in what are known as the private parts or the, or the man's private parts, the yard, um, they often did uh, irrigation using this kind of a smaller clister, as is what they called, we would call it a syringe, and they would irrigate it with warm oil or milk and water, um, sometimes other things such as sulfur-based um, healing for, for the interior ulcers that these diseases caused. Such crude remedies were more guesswork than science. Wartime records do not indicate how many soldiers had to endure this treatment, but one fact seems certain. No one wanted to do it twice. Following the war, Peggy Shippen left Philadelphia and moved to England. She didn't find life in London easy or lucrative with her now infamous husband, the traitor Benedict Arnold. Hoping to better her condition once again, she came back to America. Peggy Shippen returned to Philadelphia and to stay with her parents for a while. But she soon discovered that she was not wanted in this city. And she finally left, never to return. Benedict Arnold was never happy about the way he was treated in England. England didn't want him either because he came to represent something that showed the underside of Revolutionary War. In the end, Peggy Shippen never realized the wealth of which she dreamed. Instead, both Peggy and Benedict Arnold lived out the rest of their lives shunned by British society. In death, they were laid to rest in St. Mary's Church in London. After the war, Britain's flamboyant general, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, continued to live the playboy lifestyle and became a successful playwright and author. General George Washington, America's military commander, finally stopped living in other people's houses and moved back to his own home in Mount Vernon, Virginia. In 1789, Washington was sworn in as the new nation's first president. And as for Private Yankee Doodle, he went home, got married, and raised his family. Post-war records don't indicate whether he ever told his wife all he had seen and done during the war. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy.